This video is Western blot. I want to make a couple points about why we are studying this. First off, this is a key technique that we use to visualize proteins. Um, so this is one of our goals. By learning about this technique, we're going to reinforce some of our knowledge about protein chemistry. Secondly, we're going to learn how to interpret data from a Western blot, which is a course theme. And we're going to go through the first few learning outcomes um, in this video. So a Western blot is a method to detect specific proteins within a sample or tissue. It can tell us about the presence and the amount of the protein. This is a Western blot here, so it looks a lot like a DNA gel, um, and this is somewhat analogous to agarose gel electrophoresis as a way to visualize DNA. However, in this technique, we're using a Western blot, um, which will break into several techniques to visualize protein. Now I want to show you how to break down a Western blot so that we can get specific results about proteins as far as their presence and their amount. And so you should be able to do this before you come to class next time, and we will be doing some more complex data analysis. I'd encourage you to check out these resources um, down here, uh, which is this uh, Becker textbook reading is short and it's up on Moodle, and then here's a reading from your textbook to hear a little different approach. It's a little choppy though because they're um, really just featuring some very limited parts of the technique, uh, but it should accompany this uh, video. Okay, so the basic idea is that uh, we load samples into different wells, just like we would for a DNA gel. And so we can see that there are um, one, two, three, four, five, six different lanes. This uh, lane here on the far left, this is the ladder or size standard. And you should be able to label that. These are known um, protein sizes, and so we can use that as a gauge to estimate the size of the proteins that we visualize. This also might be known as a molecular marker. The other five lanes, which are shown here, indicate some sort of experimental samples. At the beginning of the western blot, all of these items are added to the top of the gel, and then through the process of electrophoresis, they will migrate through the matrix that's provided. And just like with G DNA electrophoresis, uh, the, after the um, sample has, samples have been run, then the samples that have migrated the farthest through the matrix will have the smallest molecular weight, which you can see labeled here. These are a little grainy, but this says about, it's either 15 or 16 of uh, the units. And then the samples that have the largest molecular weight will be at the top. And so we see here that this one is 150. And of course, this is going to vary from experiment to experiment and would be labeled. Okay, so now we're going to break down the image. And this is going to be a really key technique uh, to be able to interpret data. This is something we're going to be doing throughout the rest of the term occasionally. And it will be a question on every exam, like an essay question that's about 10 points per exam that would be worth 100 points. Um, so we'll get some practice with this, but the first thing to do is to locate um, the loading control. And so this is a vocabulary word. Um, so the loading control you'd be able to pick out for two reasons. Um, first off, it's consistent across all of the experimental treatments, and it's going to be one of these um, series of dark bands. And it's going to be consistent in two respects. One, the amount of darkness, so as far as how dark it is or how wide it is, um, which is going to indicate how much protein is present there. Um, and it also would be consistent as far as its location on the gel, as far as how far down uh, the gel that it runs. And so let's take a look at our options. So we basically have three different things that um, are being labeled in this image. Uh, so there's something called SDHA, so that would be this protein across here. We also have beta-actin, which is this protein across here. And then we have something called MTCOX1, uh, which we see is this um, sample across here. And so, again, we're looking for something that has a similar darkness across all of the experimental conditions and same location. So it could either be SDHA or beta-actin here. Um, and you'll see that there's some variation across one sample to the next. This is totally normal for uh, any sort of aspect of science, really, um, and especially for Western blots. Um, and so this is really a qualitative assessment to look at it. 
And it's pretty hard to tell between those with what you know right now, but I'm going to tell you um, straight off the back, the beta actin is almost always a loading control. Um, so that's the second tip off here. And as you may recall from other classes, um, actin is part of the cytoskeleton. This is something that is used in all eukaryotic cells, and it's thought to be, um, and it's been shown to be quite consistent across all cells under all conditions. And so I will almost always ask you to label the loading control. What I want you to do for that is not to label the name of it, uh, but instead, uh, but instead to circle the actual bands of protein, um, which are on the gel. So here we see beta actin for the first sample, second, third, fourth, and fifth. And so you can uh, circle it something like that. So what a loading control is, is this is a way for the scientists to say that for the experiment that they did, as far as the samples that they actually loaded here, that they want to show that they loaded uh, a baseline amount of their protein uh, and kind of slurry, and we're going to hear more about that soon. Uh, but basically, they can use beta actin as sort of like a way to normalize the amount that they've loaded. And so this is kind of like if you tear a scale uh, to be able to, once you put some weigh boat on there, weigh boats are going to vary a little bit from um, one size to another, and so this is a way to kind of reset the scale. And so what that means is with this loading control, now we can compare the expression levels of the protein across all of the other conditions, um, and we can decide if that protein changes, and if so, how. And the next thing that we want to do when we break down the Western blot is um, to be able to sort out what are the proteins of interest. Eventually, this is going to tie into a biological question and um, overall understanding about the process that's happening. But for now, um, we just want to get an idea of what their names are. And so basically, uh, the proteins of interest are other proteins besides the loading control that are visualized on the gel. And specifically, they are going to be labeled, usually off to the side, um, somewhere over here, for example. And we, as I mentioned before, there's two other things that are labeled, this SDHA and MTCOX1. And so now we can get to the third question, which is where we can get more into the biology of things, um, which is, do the proteins of interest change um, in intensity across the treatments? And so again, the two things that we're going to check out are SDHA and MTCOX1. So you could pause the video now and think about um, which of those looks like it changes. And again, what we're trying to do here is look for intensity. So for each of the uh, lanes that we look at uh, in a particular position, so how does the amount of darkness um, appear? And so basically, um, hopefully you've come across that um, SDHA, and I alluded to this before, is pretty consistent across all the different treatments in, as far as its intensity. Um, and on the other hand, MTCOX1, we see a lot of it in the first treatment, kind of a medium amount in the second treatment, then it really starts to drop off in the third and fourth treatment, and we can't even see it in the fifth. And so the answers uh, for these two proteins that are shown on this uh, Western blot is that, and this is what my assessment would be just kind of qualitatively, so um, yes, um, MTCOX1 changes over these treatments um, or different tissues, whatever we're examining, comparing here, but there's little to no change for SDHA. Okay, there's one more thing I just noticed as we're getting to the bottom of the gel here that I did not label at the beginning, um, and that was to talk about the unit for our size standard. Um, and so basically these numbers that we see here, this is the protein weight. And the unit for this is kilodaltons. which is usually KDA, but sometimes it's KD. Okay, so that's basically analyzing the Western blot, and now I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, this kind of a little unsatisfactory comment here about is this little to no change for SDHA. And so, um, as I'm sure you're aware from other science courses you've taken, we can qualitatively look at things. Um, we can also hopefully quantitate them. And so I want to show you how we can quantitate the intensity of the proteins um, detected um, from a Western blot. And so the name of that technique is densitometry, um, and this is the quantitation of protein intensity. So sometimes this is going to be provided to you on a Western blot. Other times you're going to need to draw this out on your own as a way to estimate and visualize the intensity on a, um, on a graph. So basically this is the kind of graph that we would draw for that. 
um, as far as the axes. Um, and so on the y-axis is going to be the optical density, which is basically the darkness, um, which might be me measured in pixels, um, of um, MTCOX1 protein. And so sometimes you'll see this over the loading control, like actin, so as a ratio. So basically we can um, really sort out exactly how much of the loading control was present, and there might have been very slight fluctuations. Um, and so I'll write that in now. And then we're going to see a little bar graph, um, just kind of, again, try to put a visual to this for our um, five different experimental treatments, one, two, three, four, and five. And again, we're going to draw this ourselves here um, just to get some practice with what it is. So basically what I would do is look at the data for MTCOX1 and pick the highest amount of the MTCOX1. Like, where is that really obvious? Um, and so that would be in lane one here. And so I would just kind of arbitrarily... Um, put your line here, and then we'll draw that as the height of the bar graph. And then, um, obviously, there's nothing um, in, or little, really nothing we can see in the last one, so I would pick that as your next one, and so that would basically be like this. Um, I'm just drawing something in so you can see I put something there. Um, and then our second lane has something kind of in the middle. If we try to imagine, like, how does this amount of darkness compare to this? And we try to imagine, like, what would it look like if this were half as dark? So I think this is still darker than that. Maybe that's, like, a third or a fourth as um, intense um, as this um, empty Cox one. So then I would just kind of eyeball that here. So maybe that's about a third here. Um, and then if we look at lanes three and four, those look pretty similar to each other. Um, and there may be half, if not a little less than that, of this one here. And that's basically what our densitometry looks like when we draw that ourselves. Um, and so basically we're looking for kind of a, a um, baseline here. We, we're not being super specific. Um, we don't know what the unit is, but this is a way to visualize the data. And if it were an actual experiment, then hopefully they would have replicates, and you'd see some error bars here. Now let's talk about the procedural overview to get that western blot. Uh, so this is kind of a long process, and I'm going to break it down into four main steps. You should know each of the steps, and there will be a more detailed video about each of the steps. Okay, so here are the four different steps. Um, and we've got some pictures with them. So the first step is sample preparation, and this is basically when we make something that is called a cell lysate. And so um, you can see here that um, we've got someone who's got gloves on um, that is holding a uh, centrifuge tube, and we can see there's this kind of like yellowish, kind of slightly hazy looking um, liquid in here, and so that's the cell lysate. Uh, what this is is a slurry of the cell innards. And this contains, uh, the, basically the cells have been lysed or broken apart, and so all the proteins, RNAs, carbohydrates, lipids have all been uh, bleh, just um, floating around in this liquid. Then our second step to be able to visualize the proteins through a Western blot is a step called PAGE, and that is in all capital letters. And um, basically what that stands for is polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Um, here's that name again, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Um, and basically, we see a uh, little contraption here. Um, notice that this uh, root part of the word should sound very familiar, gel electrophoresis. When you run a DNA gel, you run an agarose gel electrophoresis. And instead, when we do proteins, we use um, polyacrylamide as the matrix. And so um, we can see that there's um, kind of a gooey-looking thing here. This is the actual gel. And then they actually run... Um, vertically instead of horizontally, and um, then you can see that there are little bands that are separating out here, just like you would for a DNA gel. But again, what we're separating out with um, PAGE is protein, and that has to do with what we um, collect from this slurry and then what we add in here, and I haven't given you all those details yet. Then the third step of uh, preparing a western blot is the transfer. Um, so the transfer is um, a situation where we use a little piece of equipment here, which is kind of hard to tell what's going on. It looks a little bit like maybe a car battery with the red and the black um, cables coming out of it. And that does allude to that we're going to use electrical current for this step. Uh, and so basically this is going to take 
this gel goo from the page, which has the proteins all run through it, and so they're all hanging out there in the, the gel. Um, and the gel, especially for polyacrylamide, is very fragile. I'm sure you guys know you handle DNA gels very carefully. Polyacrylamide gels are really, really, really thin, like um, kind of like a piece of paper. And so basically the um, proteins are transferred from that gel onto some filter paper, um, which is much more stable. Um, and this type of filter paper is called a nitrocellulose membrane. And so that's much more manageable um, and to handle in the laboratory. And so basically, again, the way this happens to get from the gooey gel to this um, filter paper is um, to use electrical current, and then it will wick the proteins onto the filter paper using capillary action. Um, so it's kind of like if you took a stack of paper towels and then tried to soak up some liquid. Um, that's basically what we're doing to um, put the filter paper on top of this gel and then pull the proteins onto it. The proteins all stay in their same orientation um, if we do a proper transfer. And the last step that I'm going to talk about is the actual Western blot. And so basically looking at uh, the images that are here for the Western blot. So this is a schematic about some of the different steps that are taking place um, to uh, the transferred um, proteins that are hanging out on that nitrocellulose membrane. Okay, so to zoom in, let's check out what that schematic, schematic shows us. So here's the filter paper is this line. Um, then we have our protein here, and this would be our protein of interest. It's just this kind of blobby thing that's sitting on or in the filter. Um, then what attaches to that through this procedure is something called the primary antibody. And, um, and that's symbolized by this Y. Notice that that is one shade of blue. Uh, then what attaches to a primary antibody, antibody through this procedure is a secondary antibody. It, notice, um, has the same shape, this Y shape, but it's a different shade, um, so that indicates that they are not the exact same um, kind of antibody. And so the whole reason why we're making this big um, setup is that uh, our protein of interest is invisible to us. We have no way to see that. Um, however, we can find it with an antibody and other work um, which had been done in the field for this particular protein um, would um, have a dedicated primary antibody that would bind to it. Um, and then we can also bind a secondary antibody to it and then based on uh, the secondary antibody, there's a little conjugated dye here, uh, which is really hard to read, uh, but this like kind of star thing is a fluorescent molecule. And so if we hit it with a laser beam, then, um, then it will produce fluorescence, which we can then detect um, using some sort of imager. And so this is kind of like the DNA dye that you would use. There's just extra steps here, um, uh, which have to do with the chemistry of the protein. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what an antibody is. So um, an antibody uh, is used to detect a specific protein, um, for example, the protein of interest. Um, each protein needs to have its own antibody, um, and an antibody is an immune protein which binds tightly and highly specifically to proteins of interest. I'm happy to talk to anybody about how we produce those. Um, there's a lot of backstory that goes into them, and I worked with them a lot in graduate school. Um, I'm trying to keep it a little on the shorter end here. Okay, so I want to talk a little more about that secondary antibody here, um, which has this funky glowy thing here. So the last antibody that's shown, which is called the secondary antibody here, um, is conjugated, which is a fancy word to say covalently bound to another molecule. In this case, it is a fluorescent molecule, which means that this is a molecule which can um, produce light um, when it's hit with a certain frequency, um, like with a laser beam. And that's something that we can actually detect or visualize using a particular uh, microscope or camera. Okay, so that is the end of the steps of the Western blot.